Is there any area of your life that is out of control? This takes me to a deeper question. Is there any place in your life that you feel you're losing your control? Well, I thought I would give us a pop quiz this morning as we start this message. Do you struggle with any of the following desires? Acceptance by others. How powerful is your need for acceptance? Secondly, being loved by other people. Is this a motivating factor in your decisions? What about pleasure? Are you dominated by whatever is fun or makes you feel good at the moment? What about sex? Do you have any sexual desires outside of the boundaries of God's will? What about wealth and security? Are these a priority in your life? Achievement. Has a healthy desire to itself become competitive and out of control? What about fame? Do you seek prestige without just thinking about the consequences or the cost? What about happiness? What will you do or who will you become in the pursuit of happiness? This is a good one. Personal appearance. Are you consumed with the desire to look better than other people? What about control? I struggle with this one. Do you? Do you, do you love to control people, especially your children? Or to be in positions of power and authority? What about self-acceptance? Are you discontent with yourself or how God made you? Well, we are in a real war with God, with other people, and sometimes even with ourselves over our own lives. If this happens, we are experiencing tension, stress, unhappiness, because the truth of the matter is that even when we try or want to control everything, we can and will not. Our key passage for this sermon series has been Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23. And I, I'm assuming we already know this by memory, right? Do we? But the fruit of the Spirit is... Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, right? Do I think, well, no, no, I don't think I keep preaching. There is no law against these things. So today we are going to be looking at the last virtue of the fruit of the Spirit, and it's self-control. We have entitled this message, Self-Control, Grace in Command. It is interesting that the list of virtues starts with love and ends with self-control. Let me ask you this question, honestly. How good are you at self-controlling your life? Raise your hand. Raise your hand. Amen. Are you so good? Do you get 100? Okay, none of you. Raise your hand. Well, if you did, this message is not for you, or you're probably lying, or you are in denial. Okay, today... I want to talk about your number one travel maker. It is the person that you look in the mirror every single morning. That is the person that is going to make it the most difficult for you in the days ahead because a lack of self-control in any part of our lives doesn't feed who we really are in Christ. His desire is that we live in full surrender to him and that his spirit will produce self-control, self-discipline. Each week we are choosing a real fruit to help us be reminded of the way that God has called us to live. This week we are looking at the uh, strawberry. How many look love the strawberry? Well, I love them. You know, the strawberry you eat is actually not a fruit or a berry. It is the enlarged receptacle of the flower. Did you know that? You didn't, right? Strawberries are bright red, like this one, juicy and sweet. They are so good. I would eat them, but it's coronavirus season. I can't. I don't know how many people touch this. Um, you know, they're so good. You know, they are so good, and they're a good source of vitamin C and also contain decent amounts of vitamin B9 and potassium. They are rich in antioxidants and plant compounds, which might help you, you know, for heart risk, you know, health, and, and also for blood sugar control. Wow, I didn't know that. 
Strawberries are used in different jams, jellies, and desserts. If you like strawberries, you cannot just eat one. You want to eat like the whole bunch. Like, I want to eat this. You want to exhibit self-control, especially if they are covered with chocolate, oof, caramel, oof, and all sorts of candy. My daughter loves strawberries. I mean, if I put a bus, she will devour that bus right away. It will be expensive every day. Now, when you look at the scriptures, the term self-control is often associated with self-discipline. Tom Landry, former coach of the Dallas Cowboys, has a phrase that I love a lot regarding developing a discipline. He said, my job is to get men to do what they do not enjoy doing in order that they might achieve what they have always dreamed of. Of course, he follows the statement with the word discipline. There is nothing cute, easy, or funny about discipline, especially when it comes to the subject of self-control. To deal with this topic, we have to look inside of us. We have to look at the root of the problem. There are many passages in the scriptures to talk about this term, but there is one in particular that I believe, I believe is very descriptive of the essence of self-control. This is one of the easiest passages in the Bible for me to identify with. It tells me the absolute truth about the life of the believer. It is found in Romans chapter 7. And it looks at the nature of self-control. The nature of self-control. Romans 7 verses 18 to 21 I'm going to read from the message. We don't have this one in Spanish, so I'm going to read it in English. It says, I realize that I don't have what it takes. I can will it, but I can't do it. I decide to do good, but I don't really do it. I decide not to do bad, but then I do it anyway. My decisions, such as they are, don't result in actions. Something has gone wrong deep within me and gets the better out of me every time. It happens so regularly that it's predictable. The moment I decide to do good, sin is there to trip me up. How many say amen to that? Not many? Okay. You can say it with me. That's me. Say it with me. That's me. Well, I see myself all over Romans chapter Seven. Fritz Redner, in his little book, it's a classic, How to Be a Christian Without Being Religious, he puts it this way. What is your problem? Temper, impatience, sex, being honest, self-control, your thought life. Everyone has skeletons that don't always stay in the closet. You want to do right, but then you do wrong. You want to choose obedience, but then you choose sin. Sometimes you would even swear that you have a split personality, a walking civil war. That's totally right, isn't it? Don't you think? Can you relate to it? I mean, we have our problem here described. We have a problem here described. And our problem is found in Proverbs, you know, 25, 28. There is this proverb that goes right in line with this statement. It says, like a city whose walls are broken through, it's a person who lacks self-control. That is why the ancient cities first built the wall. Remember Nehemiah, they built this humongous wall and then they rebuilt the city. They rebuilt the walls and then they rebuilt the city. The wall protected and provided security to the city. And oftentimes, the wall that is missing in our lives is the wall of self-control. When there is no wall, your flesh, our flesh, kicks in. You know, unfortunately, it happens in our lives more times than what we would like. We can all remember times when we did not have this wall to protect us. We remember saying, why in the world did I say this? Why in the world did I go to this place? Why in the world did I look at this image one more time? Why did I do that? Do you relate to that? And sometimes, sometimes we say, I knew better, but I, but I did it. 
It's like you have the little demon and you have the angel here. They're always competing. What's going on? We see the Apostle Paul. Come out. Apostle Paul, he wrote the third part of the New Testament, inspired by the Holy Spirit. And he's saying right now, he's telling us through the scriptures that he had this struggle with self-control. Then we lament, lament, and lament. In some cases, it takes us months, years, or we haven't been able to recover from it. It is still hurts, all because of the lack of self-control. We have our natural tendency here. Now, having admitted that that's me, that's us, let me show you, let me show us what it could look like without the wall. And taking away the work of the Holy Spirit. In other words, living our lives in the flesh. In the Greek term, sarx, moral, fallen, human state. You know, that's our natural tendency. That's the natural tendency we are born with. It is our way of thinking, our impulses, our natural reaction to life. Galatians chapter 5, 16 to 18 says, But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit. And the desires of the spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other. To keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Simply stated, the flesh and the spirit, they're enemies. They are constantly in opposition to each other. You think about praying more, but then your body wants to sleep a little bit more. You want to read the scriptures, but your mind wants to watch another episode of your favorite show on Netflix, or Hulu, Amazon Prime, Disney Plus. You want to read anything else, but not the scriptures. Sometimes it's like, that's so boring. You know, you want to try to start exercising back again, you know, during coronavirus. That's horrible. I moved from the valley. I used to go to, uh, to the gym at 5.30. I, I was one of those guys. Once in a while. Once in a lifetime. But I, I used to do it. But then it's hard to recover, right? It's, it's hard to do that. You know, you try to faithfully start attending church and then another priority comes up, either online or in person. You want to start eating healthier, but instead you eat all the unhealthy food that comes your way. Especially the holidays are coming up. And if you are like me, I love, you know, vitamin G, which is grease, tacos, you know, tortas, tortillas, everything that is greasy is good, but it's unhealthy. You know what? That happens. The things that I please are usually the wrong things. And that's our natural tendency. Then what can I do? If my natural tendency is to live a life controlled by the flesh, what can I do? That's the exclamation in the Greek, in the original. What can I do? That's what the Apostle Paul says. There is this constant struggle in my life. I can't do it, but I cannot do it, but I can't do it. I tried and I tried and I tried and I tried. You and I will never be what we are to be until heaven, until the rapture. We will never be any better by the flesh. Our flesh will never help us become better followers of Jesus Christ. In fact... It is completely the opposite. I love the old song that ends, that we shall be where we would be, then we shall be what we should be. Then which we are not now, nor could be, should shall be our own. That like a tongue twister, right? It's an old song. It's an old hymn. You know it. It sounds like that, but that's, that's the flesh. It is not about the theology we know. It is not about the education we have, the possessions we have. It is about the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And then the Bible says, but things that God doesn't end there. The Lord doesn't say, do your best and hang my cross around your neck and tell people about me and then I will bless you. No, that's not what he says at all. We are helpless and hopeless, but the passage continues with the fruit of the Spirit. That is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, 
and self-control. Against such things, there is no law. When we have Christ, when we have Christ, that's the foundational. That's the foundation of everything. This is a spirituality one-on-one. When the spirit of, his, of God is in control, he dominates the flesh. That means that if I have a loose tongue, the spirit will refrain it. If I have a problem with my temper, how many say amen? Don't say it. Confessions later. Hashtag confessions later. If I have a problem, a problem with my thoughts, you know, those horrible thoughts that come, traumatic events, abuses, you know, in childhood, all these things, words, you know, the spirit will provide me mental restraint. If I have a problem with moral issues, with my eyes, the spirit will give me moral restraint. If I have a problem with my finances, the spirit will give me wisdom to be a good steward. If I have a problem with my relationships, oh Lord, help me out. The spirit will give me guidance and provide emotional intelligence and wisdom to deal with them. That's what it means. That's being hashtag genuine. That's what it means. The Apostle Paul continues to explain in Romans 7 what is happening to him and therefore what's happening to us. He says this, I tried everything. Okay? I tried everything. This is Apostle Paul, St. Paul. And nothing helps. I am at the end of my rope. Is there no one who can do anything for me? Isn't that the real question? Wow, Paul, what's talking? What is he talking about here? What a reality is this? This is hitting home for all of us in the room. Sometimes we try literally everything and nothing helps. I'm not going to do it again. I'm not going to do it again. I'm not going to do it again. And then you end up doing it. We feel like we are at the end of the rope, at the end of our failing attempts to recover from this horrible and hopeless condition. Is there a solution to all this? Yes, there is. <laughs> the need of self-control. As we continue reading the narrative, the apostle comes up with an answer. We can read it in verse 25. Here is the answer. The answer, thank God, is that Jesus Christ can and does. He acted to set things right in this life of contradictions where I want to serve God with all my heart and mind, but I'm pulled by the influence of sin to do something totally different. Oh, I love this. There is a solution to it. You know, but I thank God. This is our solution. I love that he starts the verse by saying, thank God. The answer is Jesus. Jesus comes into the picture to make everything right. He comes to bring reconciliation. Then you find yourself saying, I don't need to be like that. I don't need to respond like that. I don't need to think like that. I have his authority. I am the child of the king. I am his vessel. I have his word. I have his message. I have his power to do what I cannot do on my own. I have his presence with me at all times. I have all the promises in the scriptures that are truthful. I have purpose, meaning, direction through him, and I have eternal life. I have the power of the Holy Spirit to overcome every single circumstance in my life. Can I get an amen? Oof, I got excited. And in English, you see, <laughs> Paul is a Jew, you know, but he's also a Greek. It is notorious that the apostle is a sports guy. Do we have any sports guys in the room? You know, I didn't meet him. Ah, we have one, you know, some here. You know, I didn't meet him in person, but it's notorious that he was. You know, it is obvious because many of his illustrations revolve around athletics. We can see it in the following passage. 1 Corinthians 9, 24 and 25, he says this. Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into a street training. They do it to get a crown that will not last. But we do it to get a crown that will last forever. In a race, everybody runs. How many of you have participated in a race, you know? 
a marathon or something or walking. I, I do the ones walking sometimes. You know, those are easy. In a race, everybody runs, but only one gets the prize. So this immediately gets your attention. By the way, it is a race run in a depraved world. It is a race won with a depraved nature. It is a race won when every friend of yours is depraved, is fallen in nature. It is a race won with a church full of sinners. It is a race that goes against all odds, but none of them overwhelming the power of the spirit, the work of Christ in your heart and in your mind. It is that race, but we, we are not running alone. Everybody that competes in these games needs to exercise self-control. If you don't want to be disqualified, you need to operate under the rule of the spirit. How many athletes have been disqualified after competing? You know, you see it on the news. <laughs> That's a shame. You know, he won the race, but then after a you know, few months, they discovered oh, there was something illegal about that. Wow. We need self-control to practice all the virtues of the fruit of the spirit. We need self-control to love sacrificially. We need self-control to be joyful in all circumstances. We need self-control to operate under God's peace and not under anxiety. We need self-control to realize that God is good in the midst of our most difficult situations. We need self-control to be kind and gentle, even, even when we do not feel like it. Sometimes it's most of the time. It starts with love and it is maintained throughout with self-control, with self-discipline. What is interesting here is that all these people running on races do so to win a prize, whatever it was, gold, silver, bronze. That prize gets tarnished. In those days, it was a wreath and a big, a big round bronze plaque that they, was, uh, they, they would bring to the city of origin. They will bring that plague, they will hang it in there, and sometimes they got a reduction in taxes. Oh, that would be nice. But that was temporary. You know, the apostle reaffirms this truth when he says in 1 Corinthians 9, Therefore, I do not run like someone running aimlessly. I do not fight like a boxer beating the air. No, I strike a blow to my body and make it my slave so that after I preach to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the price. We see a commitment here. I love the I statements here. I love him. He refers to the discipline of the athletes. It means that I, you, and me make an intentional effort to submit to the rules of the game, the rules of the Holy Spirit. There is no worse thing than being disqualified for the prize. Athletes train all their lives for races and sometimes for games. Let's talk about quarterbacks, right? The, they're the second, the third one, and they're just waiting for the moment, that moment to shine. It's like they've been training all their lives since high school. It's like, oh my goodness, I want to make it, I want to make it, and then they get five minutes. And if, if they don't do it right, <laughs> they're gone, you know, they're gone. That happens. God wants us to run with the paracleto. That's not a word in Spanish. That's a Greek word. That's the Holy Spirit. The one that works alongside us. He wants us to walk with the paracleto, with the Holy Spirit. He's going to be with us. We are not solo. We are walking with him. He wants us to live by his power in us. The solution is Jesus. He is the author and perfecter of our faith. Let's look at Jesus. Let's look at the cross. No other symbol incorporates more passion and promise than the cross. Jesus said, carry your cross daily and follow me. The cross is both vertical and horizontal. Vertically, we remain connected to God, his kingdom, eternal life, a wonderful a spiritual truth with divine principles and glory. Horizontally, to our left and to our right, we are surrounded by our community, relationships, family, culture, and society. Simply stated, the cross is both vertical and horizontal. It is redemption and it is relationship. It is covenant and it is community. 
It is kingdom and it's society. It is both righteousness and justice. It is ethos and it's pathos. It is John 3.16 and Matthew 25. <laughs> it is both Billy Graham and Martin Luther King Jr. You know, it is the blending of prayer and activism. It is where faith is fleshed out into good works. Where a loving God with a pure heart leads us to loving those around us in a way that is just and right. Why? Why? Because more than 20, uh, 2,000 years ago, an eternal God man showed up. And they, he showed us the way to daily live, to love God, to love others, and do what is right. That's the kingdom of God. Amen? That's the kingdom of God. You know, the new normal of self-control. We see our memory verse for the, for the week, 2 Timothy 1, 7. And this is what the apostle Paul says to his apprentice, his disciple, Timothy. He tells him this, For God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. I love it. I love it. I love this translation too. For the spirit of God gave us, doesn't make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. You know, we have our new power. There is power in the name of Jesus. How many believe that? There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power given to us by the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. The resounding question that comes to mind is, are we living under this power? Better yet, are we allowing this power to rule over our lives? The Apostle Paul is talking to his disciple and he's reminding him as a spiritual father of one of those profound lessons he had learned throughout his life. He's very descriptive when he says, God has given us a spirit not of fear, but of power, love, and self-discipline. It seems like the perfect description to end these virtues, <laughs> the manifestations of the fruit of the spirit. What is the key to self-control? Well, self-control requires that we think before we act. Self-control requires that we think before we act. If we fail to do this, we will regret it. Self-control requires believing in our hearts that the Holy Spirit who lives in us will enable us. You know, self-control requires believing in our hearts that the Holy Spirit who lives in us will enable us. You know, we need to think about that. When we are tempted to lose our control, we could ask ourselves the following questions. Is this better than having God's perfect will for my life? Let's think about that. How will this affect my spirituality? How will this affect my health? How is this going to affect how others see me? Will they see someone who is truly committed to the Lord or someone who claims to be a believer but doesn't like, doesn't act like it? Is the fruit of the Spirit evident in my life all day, every day? Do I portray it like that? I have two simple steps today and I hope that if you didn't get the message prior to this, you get these two. They are encapsulated here. First one, very simple. From a PhD to an elementary kid. Let go of your ego. Sometimes we have to do like the frozen song. You just have to let it go. Let it go, let it go, let it go. Let go of your ego. Let us just come before the Lord and say, Lord, take control of my life. Take control of my relationships. Take control of everything that I'm going through right now. I want to let go of my ego, of my thinking, of everything that is inhibiting the work of the Holy Spirit. Secondly, 
Let God take control of your life. Simple. How do you do that? Well, the Apostle Paul says, you know, the answer, instead of giving us three or four or five steps, <laughs> he claims it right there. Simple. He says, the answer is Jesus. <laughs> the answer is Jesus. Jesus could help us. He could empower us. He could give us the strength, the wisdom that we need. I don't know what's going on in your life today. And as we wrap up this sermon series today, we have talked about love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. We talk about the fruit of the Spirit. We all struggle with something in life. And perhaps you feel like the Apostle Paul. You pull away. You feel that like you are at the end of the rope. You tried literally everything. Maybe you who are watching online. And you say today, I don't know how to do it. Let me tell you that there is hope. And the hope is found in Jesus Christ. And for those of us in the room, like the Apostle Paul, we are in this constant battle. And sometimes we feel like we are in this split personality. <laughs> it's like, I try and I try, but I can't. Let's surrender ourselves to Jesus Christ. Let's come to him today. Would you? Would you come to him? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for who you are. You are majestic. You are powerful. Lord, you created us and, and you have sustained us. You provided a way for us to go back to you through Jesus Christ. Lord, there is no way we can do it by ourselves. There is no way. So today we surrender ourselves completely to you. Jesus Christ. Take control of our minds, our hearts, and our actions today. Lord, help us to be reminded that the Paracleto, the Holy Spirit, will be with us. Help us to lean to you and to your promises. Help us to come to you in every and single situation in our lives. Lord, help us to be empowered by you and to do your will. We pray all these things in the precious and mighty name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.